There we go. All right, good. So I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar, and it's about planning the post-COVID-19 contact center. And I'm Mike Aoki. I'll be your host for today's session. And I also want to introduce our panel as well. And we have wonderful panelists. You can see the video there uh, with them. Uh, we have uh, Dan Chiaffi uh, from Terranet, uh, ter uh, sorry, Terranet in Toronto, Canada. Jonathan Bell, uh, employment attorney and founder of Bell Law Group from Garden City, New York. And Neil Toff, uh, president and co-founder of Cuds uh, uh, Callzilla in Miramar, Flor Miramar, Florida. And I want to look all, welcome all of you to the panel today. And as well, I want to look, welcome all of our guests, all of our audience members watching this from all across the world. Uh, and it's a great opportunity for us to go and share ideas and be able to go look at how to plan out the second half of the year. And of course, with the impact of COVID-19, the pandemic, it's made a lot of changes, obviously, to our, to our contact center industry in the past 12 months. And certainly even looking ahead to the second half of the year, more adjustments to go. So we'll find out more about that. Also, we've got some questions for our panel, but as well, anyone can ask questions. So in terms of being an audience member, you're free to go and, and ask questions by typing questions in the chat window or the Q&A box. So if you're full screen right now, at the very bottom center of the screen, there's that little chat window. You can click on that, open that up and actually type in questions. And you can type in questions even starting now that you want us to go and ask. We'll have a couple of Q&A sessions during this, uh, during this show. Also, you can use the Q&A window if you want. Either one's fine. I'll be looking at both of those to be able to help field questions for the panel. One last thing I want to mention as well is I want to give a special shout out and thanks to Lantelligence. And I just want to thank them for helping to organize this webinar as well as several past webinars as well. Um, and Lantelligence, just briefly, is a contact center solutions provider. So they're able to go and work with a number of different providers to be able to help get the best solution possible for digital transformation for contact centers. And they also organize webinars like this in terms of being able to help spread education and spread knowledge within our industry. And I want to thank Ken with Lintelligence in Oakville, Canada, and also Marty in San Diego from Lintelligence for just doing so much to go and help make these webinars happen. And I want to start things off right now, though, with a quick poll. I want to hear from you about this. So I'm going to launch a quick poll right now, actually a couple of polls. The first one up is the question, which is, what percentage of your contact center staff will be on site every workday post-COVID? Okay, so a percentage of your contact center staff will be on site every work there. Basically, you're bringing people back to the office again. I'll give you a moment just to go and type in your vote, share your opinion, and I'll show the results in a moment. Okay, I'll give it a few more seconds just for everybody to finish voting. Again, what percentage of your contact center staff will be on site uh, every workday post COVID? Okay, we'll share the answers on screen. Most popular answer was one to 50% of your team will be on site. The rest will work from home the other uh, most of the time. And that dovetails with a lot of surveys that I've seen that typically it's around that, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60% mark, kind of in the middle there in terms of how many will come back to the office versus how many are staying work from home. So very much of a hybrid environment in that sense. Uh, a few of you, 15% said 100% on site every workday. So everybody back in the office again. Also one person voted for on basically for everybody working from home. So the answers are sort of all in the middle or sort of all across the uh, spectrum right now with a lot in the middle for hybrid centers. Here's a second question for you. I'll just share this with you right now. I'll just take a second to show on the screen. And the second question is, how many times a month will your work from home staff be expected to come into the office? So things like meetings, trainings, team events, town halls, etc. How many times a month will your work from home staff be expected to come into the office? Each time it could be just for half an hour, an hour, whole day, whatever, that's one incident. Okay, so how many will come into the office? How many times a month? I'll give you a few more seconds to finish voting, and I'll share these answers for the second and last question that we have for this survey. All right, so I'll share the results right now of this one. And this is actually spread across different uh, answers. The most popular one was one to two times a month in the office, having work from home staff come in. But three to five times a month is pretty popular as well. So again, a couple of very common answers there. 20% uh, of you mentioned six times or more a month for work from home staff coming into the office. And a few of you mentioned as well, they'll never come into the office. It's all virtual right now. So again, a whole range of different ideas here, uh, looking in terms of how we plan out 
the contact center for the second half of the year. And that brings up some really interesting questions as well. And, and you know, we'll start off with this one. And, and Neil, I'll ask you this question. So Neil, in terms of, of you know, being a president co-founder of CallZilla, which is a, a BPO, what are some of the biggest operational challenges that you see for contact centers post-COVID? It's a great question, Mike. Thank you. And thanks to Land Intelligence for, for having me. It's a great panel here. Uh, great set of guests that I'm looking forward to learning from. Um, so the easy answer would, would be to point to, well, it's not operational, it's technical. We have to have the technical ability to connect people to work from home. I, I would argue that um, if at this stage of the game, you're only starting to figure out your technical piece and how to plug in and get people uh, to seamlessly uh, communicate with customers, you, you're kind of on the wrong side of the equation. Uh, you have to have figured out the technical piece first. Operational is not just, forgive the expression, the butts in the seats. It's what you do in pure contact center operations. How are you recruiting? How are you selecting? How are you interviewing? How are you hiring people? What are you hiring them for? Are you hiring them to work at home? Are you trying hiring them to work uh, in a hybrid model or hiring them to work on site? How are you QAing them? Or what, what I like to refer to as quality management. Are you using, using uh, the analytics and cloud-based digital tools at your disposal um, to make things easier, faster, quicker, and more efficient to be able to know what the heck is actually going on in those conversations? Um, how are you supervising? How are you supervising productivity? How are you supervising performance? How are you ensuring compliance? Those are some really critical things. And then most important, how are you retaining? Uh, the other, only other piece I would add is uh, around retaining is in, in hiring is, and we talked about this before we went, went live with the other panelists, and I know we'll get into this a little more in the session, is it is not easy to hire and retain employees during this. Those are operational challenges because if those seats are not filled, you, you know, we're, we're in major trouble because the, the, the queues start to stack up. Uh, there's a lot of noise on social media. We're not resolving. We're not answering. And, and then we, we've created a, a, a big hole for ourselves. Hiring and retaining, I put as a operational challenge in the contact center. Hey, Neil, and those are great points as well in terms of just the operational side of things and, and again, being able to retain talent. And I know we'll have a, I'll have a question for Dana later on about that too in terms of retaining talent from that HR perspective. But definitely the upside, side, a lot of challenges you know, that are coming up. And of course, there are also some legal challenges too in terms of bringing folks back into the office. And so, Jonathan, I've got a question for you from a legal perspective, which is what are some of the legal issues that employers should address post-COVID? So Mike, thanks a lot uh, for that question and, and having me on uh, this panel. I think it's a great panel and appreciate the fact that it's international. As you know, um, my office uh, is based out of New York. Uh, so that's my specialty and that's where I'm gonna focus uh, mostly on, but everybody needs to be aware of what their local laws are. are um, you know, not only state laws, but sometimes the city laws as well that we have to be concerned with, but uh, you know, when employers come to me with working from home employees, the difficulty a lot of times for hourly employees are tracking those hours because the employer has a duty to track the hours and uh, employees when they're home, they may at times work more hours than they're technically allowed to. And after 40 hours in a week, they're entitled to time and a half. Uh, that could be very costly. So how are you gonna enforce the law, if you're only asking your employees to work less than 40 hours a week, and also ensuring that they're not working, if, they're, if they work hour, if their lunch hour is unpaid, you wanna make sure that they're not working during their lunch uh, time as well, or that could be a, a, a violation of the FLSA, which could be very costly uh, uh, for an employer. So yeah, so, so that's a very difficult aspect of, of, um, of potential liability uh, for a company when they no longer have the employees at the subject premises. Now, putting that aside, uh, you know, I've, again, I've been doing this for 20 years and keeping up with the changing laws are constantly changing even before uh, the pandemic, but now it's accelerated so much. Uh, for example, uh, vaccinations here in New York uh, if an employee goes out and gets vaccinated during work hours, the employer, doesn't matter your size, has to pay that employee four hours of time. So if you're getting Pfizer or Moderna, that's technically eight hours over the course of a month that you're going to have to compensate your employee from. And you can't deduct any of their other sick leave. This is a stand, this is standalone. So if they have other sick leave, 
that's uh, you can't deduct it just because they're going to get this vaccine. Um, you know, we're dealing that now, now uh, uh, we're dealing with a lot of telework situations, people working from home. Some people need reasonable accommodations, that ergonomic chair, the keyboard. You want to make sure that you're following those guidelines. If somebody has a disability, requests a reasonable accommodation, puts in the proper medical documentation, the employer is responsible to making sure, even, in, even at home, that, uh, uh, that they're meeting those requirements under the law. Uh, employers get to make decisions whether or not they want mandatory vaccinations. I hear some employers are actually paying employees a bonus if in fact they get vaccinated. So that's kind of unique. And now the question is, well, does that bonus affect their hourly fee for overtime hours? So there's a whole host of uh, uh, new questions and issues uh, that arise. Uh, you know, in, in New York State, we're required to have some type of reopening plan. And that goes over, you know, in the office as far as having postings about uh, social distancing, mask wearing, having a log for cleaning, uh, what you're required to do if you have a sick employee with COVID. You can't disclose the person's name to the other employees, but you got to ask that employee who was sick, well, who did you have, who did you come into contact with? where you were within six feet of distance for 15 minutes or more over a 24 hour period. And once they identify those people, you gotta tell those people that they gotta go home. And sometimes the quarantine is 10 days or 14 days, but even those laws are constantly changing now for people who are vaccinated or, or people who had COVID within the last three months. So listen, this is only an hour session. I'm already, I'm just getting started. At the end of the day, know the laws, work with a lawyer, work with HR staff, make sure that you're constantly updated because you might think you're doing the right thing and you might be doing the right thing at that time and then the law has changed and now you're not. Thank you, Jonathan. You've raised some great questions as well. I know you mentioned it was about New York State, but certainly the questions that you're, that you're raising are ones that, you know, we can ask all of our local, you know, for, in terms of legal departments and HR teams, all again, all across North America and all across the world where people are watching, just to find out what the local regulations are for their jurisdiction. But some really interesting topics and, and things I didn't even consider in terms of, you know, over time and uh, you know, vaccinations and everything else. So just a lot of things to look at. And, and I know, Dana, you've got a perspective as well on this in terms of from a human resources standpoint, you know, and then from that HR standpoint, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges post COVID? Well, so first off, Mike, I want to say thanks for having me today. I really certainly appreciate it. And I just want to um, touch base with kind of what John and Neil have already said. The reality is you're going to hear a lot of themes that the three of us talk about together that are the same. And that's because the solution to this problem is not one person, one department solving. It's about the collective of the organization, right? But I want to talk a little bit about what I see as some biggest challenges from an HR perspective or from a people perspective. And I was really happy to hear actually Neil talk about some of them because you can't have an operation without people, right? So they kind of dovetail together. One of the things that, you know, we were talking about a little bit earlier um, before we, we, we set up the, uh, the call was around this race to digitize, digitization and AI. Neil mentioned that if you're not already on one side of that, um, having your uh, technology set up already, you're probably already behind. Uh, but the reality is there are some companies and organizations that are a little over to the left who don't have that full infrastructure to be able to be fully remote. So um, the challenge there I see is in the talent market, right? So hiring technology professionals um, who can support uh, an organization's strategy to drive AI. Um, we're seeing, at least in Canada, that market is really tight right now. I think also from an employee perspective, and, and we've talked a little bit about retention already, there is a heightened awareness around employee wellness and employee um, mental well-being that I think organizations need to pay attention to post-COVID. Um, the reality is this is not going to be a light switch, right? We're not just going to turn a light switch on one day and everything's going to be back to, back to normal. There's absolute, absolutely going to be a thoughtful journey that we need to participate in. One of the things also when we start talking about, you know, specifically in contact centers, how we coach um, how we maintain that quality, how we do side by sides, how we manage handle time. Um, you know, when we were hiring our leaders at a certain point in time, being able to do that virtually might not have been a competency that we were looking for. And for anybody who's been leading in a virtual environment, you'll know it's a little different, right? Being able to engage and motivate your people is a little different. I fully expect organizations to be able to support their leaders in developing that skill and competency as we move into the future. 
I also want to call out a little bit of what I call a gender exit. So there was a, a study commissioned in Canada. It's called she Covery, a little bit of a play on recovery. The reality is more women than men have left the workforce as a result of the pandemic. I would challenge all organizations to take a look at their gender uh, representation at all levels in the organization to make sure and do that sanity check, something we were probably only checking once a year, we should be checking more regularly. And certainly work with your HR teams to put strategies in place if you have seen a dip on a particular gender side um, um, of, of the equation. And certainly overall, there's gonna be impacts to engagement. Even when we return post COVID, people's heads are gonna be, are my kids safe in school? Are my elders being cared for properly? Is everybody safe? So, you know, that engagement and that focusing um, um, around um, um, your employees and, and focusing on that engagement through some other things we'll talk about in a, in a minute, I think it's critical for organizations from an HR perspective into the future. And those are really important points, Dan. Glad you brought those up. And again, they're things that our audience is composed mostly of contact center leaders, managers, directors, VPs. And so just things to really be aware of in terms of increasing employee engagement and making sure that people, you know, when they are working, can, can really focus and are free to focus on that without having to worry about all these other things that are going on, which are very serious, obviously, and very impactful, you know, to the workforce. And, and I just want to mention just a comment from the chat window that Sagita, actually, from GTAC, the chair of GTAC, the Greater Toronto Contact Center Association, just typed in a great point about women leaving the workforce. And of course, with contact centers, you know, again, you want to make sure that everyone, you know, stays engaged and, and stays, you know, involved in terms of being able to, you know, contribute in that sense. So it's just, again, some real vulnerabilities to think of. And I just want to just open this up to everybody right now. We'll do a quick little question and answer session here. So we'll do a couple of these, one at the very end, but one right now, about halfway or third of the way through. And so if any of you have questions out in the audience right now, if you have questions at all, feel free to type those in the chat window or the Q&A window. If there's a certain person you want to direct it to, either Dana, uh, uh, Jonathan, or Neil, feel free to go and put their name in just so I know who to direct the question to in terms of being able to focus on that. And I've got a few as well while we're, while we're waiting for some of the questions to come in. Um, and I just want you to build, I just say a little bit more in terms of what are some of the ideas that people can look for in terms of being able to help with that whole idea about, you know, creating that engagement, creating that sense of, of helping to engage, especially the work from home people that are. Yeah. Right so, so Mike, you know, I, um, you know, when we first talked about doing this session today, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't deep, right. Because I think that, like I said at the beginning, this isn't a one person or a one team solution, right? It's about organizations, leaders, and employees working together um, to, to move forward as a society, really. Um, one of the things that we've done at my organization that has worked really well is set up what we call a COVID response team. Now that response team actually has a set of guiding principles that we base every decision on, on not only how we got everybody home, but how we are planning on bringing everybody back. And those guiding principles sometimes are above the law, right? So, you know, you have your certain threshold that, that legislation sets, but it's okay as an organization sometimes to go above and beyond that. Um, and this response team and these guiding principles start to govern how we make decisions about bringing people back to the office. So I think that's important, a cross-functional team to just keep the sanity and be able to, to do that acid test on the decisions that you're making. Those guiding principles are very important. Um, and I think, you know, one of the big things is talk to your people. I'm going to hope that you all are already, but survey regularly understand how your people are thinking and feeling about returning, about being in the office, about the protocols that you've put in place, um, create an environment where they can bring that information to the table. I, 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 I wanna kind of go old school here, almost like a suggestion box, maybe in a virtual way or a phone number, we're in the contact of our business so we could set up a mailbox that people could call into to leave ideas, but listen to your people because they are the ones who are actually gonna be sitting at their desk or still working from home, see what it is that they need. Um, you know, I talked a little bit about diversity um, and the gender exit, what I call, uh, get ahead of that, right, before you even start bringing people back. Um, there's programs and strategies that organizations typically have in place to drive diversity and gender diversity within your organizations. Make sure you're ahead of that so you don't get caught uh, kind of behind the eight ball. Um, and I would also say rework your employee value proposition. I talked a little bit before that, um, you know, that mental uh, health and employee well-being is at the forefront for people when they're accepting jobs and the market, the market's hot right now. Um, so rework your employee value proposition to speak to some of the things that you're doing to protect your employees, how you've treated um, them and how they feel about how you how you treated them during uh, the, COVID, the COVID pandemic. For myself personally, I'm proud of what my organization has done and how they've treated our employees. 
we've checked regularly, we're doing well, uh, but we course correct. So I think it was John before that was saying, you know, sometimes things change. Uh, be transparent and honest with people. We're probably not going to get it right the first time. Let's try and get it right the second. And let's be honest with ourselves so that we can course correct uh, to get it right the second or third time. Because we're probably not going to get it right the first. Okay, that's great advice though. And I love the part about having that, you know, that again, that employee value proposition, because we're at an inflection point right now in the second half of the year, where I think a lot of organizations are vulnerable to losing people. And what happened over the last 12 months might be a contributor to that. So it's a, it's a very vulnerable point. Neil, how about yourself? I mean, leading a VPO like that, leading a whole contact center team like that. What are your thoughts about that employee engagement, retaining people for the second half of the year? Yeah, it's critical. Um, it costs whether you're a BPO, whether you are a company that has an in-house contact center, regardless, it's expensive to acquire people. It's expensive to uh, keep them engaged, train them, motivate them, create career paths, all the things that are necessary to make sure that they don't churn out. Um, so we want to protect uh, that investment in people. It's not worth it to let them have a bad experience working with us. That being said, uh, there are business objectives, and we have to be very careful in how we manage them. Uh, we can't, um, just because we're in COVID, uh, rewrite the financial statements uh, just to take into account uh, employee experience. Employee experience is absolutely critical, but it's one of many things. If you could connect it to overall business results, in my view, that's the success. What I've seen too often is that the contact center operates over here with its own contact center metrics that aren't necessarily aligned with the business metrics, the overall metrics that determine the profitability and long-time sustainability of the business. But if you can connect both, then you're going to have a winning, sustainable, long-term business. Going back to how that affects people, um, you just have to treat them well. You have to train them. You have to take into account the things that Dana mentioned. Uh, when she mentioned uh, you know, sensitivity around gender, I thought my first reaction was, huh, what? And I listened and, and I thought, okay, wait, that's interesting. I'm learning something here. I, I hadn't really thought about it from that, from those angles. So there, there, there's some truth to, to uh, kind of redesigning the perspective and taking things into account that, that are needed to, 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 to be part of the discussion. The only other thing I would uh, mention is that uh, compliance. So uh, our contact centers, whether you, regardless of industry, you're going to have uh, compliance things that come into play, regardless of what, what country you're in, uh, what industry, and you have to be compliant. Um, one thing that we found is really important in making sure that our work from home employees are able to function effectively is making sure they understand why and how we're making them compliant. Uh, in the contact center, most of us have cameras on, on the floor, right? You can't put a camera in someone's living room as much as many of us might like to do that. You can't, but there's other ways that you have to re-engineer the process uh, and figure out how to ensure compliance, regardless of whether that person is in their living room, they're at Starbucks, uh, or they're in, back in, in the contact center. Neil, I wanna, I wanna um, jump in um, and, and say something here. I think, you know, one of the things um, that I think I've learned over the course of this pandemic is that we are employees too, right? So the leaders of the contact centers, the managers of the contact centers, we are employees too. And, you know, making sure that your employees are engaged or doing well, like you need to take care of yourself as well, right? And um, I remember running a, a course years and years ago, but it was this analogy around putting on your own oxygen mask, right? Um, before you can actually put on someone else's. So it's not just about the front line. I just want to make that clear. It's about every level within the organization. So true. Wellness in the contact center. Jenny Dempsey is a colleague of mine out in San Diego. I think she pioneered it, or it was the first time I started to hear about it. Wellness in the contact center is a thing. It's a thing and we need it. And contact center employees are highly exposed to the things that could not make them well. And so you're right, whether it's a frontline employee, it's a supervisor, it's a manager, it's a whatever, it, it's absolutely critical. Agreed. Yeah, it definitely is in terms of being able just to help people, right, to stay engaged that way. And, and I love hearing, you know, Dana, from an HR perspective and Neil from an operations perspective. And Jonathan, I'll turn to you from, from a legal perspective. And a question for you is this is, you know, what else should employers be aware of or conscious of in terms of, you know, legalities around COVID-19, second half of the year, bringing folks back in or, or having them stay at home for that matter? Well, it, it, it's funny. I got a call uh, from one of my employer clients and a uh, really, really nice guy and was just trying to do the right thing and said, you know what, I, I, I want people to start coming back into the office. There's a business need, but um, you know, we have a few employees and they're over 60 years old and I think it would be dangerous for them to come in. So 
I'm going to require everybody to come in, but I'm going to uh, have those people to continue to work from home. And th the unique thing about that situation is the fact that the employer actually had very good intentions in trying to help this certain class of individuals that he viewed are at risk. However, there's an Age Discrimination and Employment Act that he's technically violating. So what I tell employers is you can't make, you know, we're not playing big brother. You can't make these decisions for these employees. You should interact with them individually, not just the people over 60, everybody, and see how they feel. And there might be somebody over 60 who really wants to come in back to the office and they feel excluded by not being allowed to come into the office and actually might have a very good lawsuit uh, against their employer based on that. So uh, never ever make decisions based on race, age, religion, gender, disability, sexual orientation uh, in the workplace, even if you have the best of intentions because you could be walking into a very, uh, a terrible lawsuit for the company. And uh, so you're, put, you're, you're putting yourself and the company at risk in that situation. Okay, good. And John, that's great advice as well. Almost as if the advice really is just check with your legal team to find out, right? To, you know, in-house to find that out. Uh, Dana, one question for you from uh, Krista, actually, who's watching this is, is can you share ideas for how to keep, one idea for how to keep your team motivated? Yeah, so I think, um, I, was it motivated or keep them well? I think I thought, I think I saw keep them well. It was actually both in the Q&A window and in the, and the chat window. So either one, keep them yeah, well. I'll, I'll, keep I'll, them. How would I talk about both? Um, okay. So I, I just, you know, to dovetail uh, kind of on what John was saying, talk to your people. Talk to your people. I, I, you know, everybody structures their, uh, you know, monthly, weekly, bi-weekly coaching sessions a little different. Um, carve out five, ten minutes of whatever that allotted time is to ask people how they are doing. Um, to John's point, talking to your people is where you're gonna get the most information versus assuming certain people will react in certain ways. Um, one of the things we've done, John, to deal with situations like that is this COVID response team has a, a subset triage team that consists of HR people where accommodations for either not returning to the office or returning to the office come in and are decisioned by this triage team in a fair and consistent manner. So it's just an idea to kind of tackle those situations you might want to share with your friend. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about the wellness piece as well. So motivating them, I think it's about staying engaged with them. Um, most organizations have some type of employee assistance program. I would challenge you to challenge your HR uh, team to pull the stats on usage of those programs over the course of the last year. I think you will be surprised um, that um, the usage, at least in our experience, hasn't necessarily gone up. That says a couple of things to me. One is we're not communicating it properly. We're not putting it out there in people's faces that there are these resources available to them. But, you know, building that fact base and having that awareness about how your, um, you know, health uh, and wellness channels are being used, I think sets the tone for any changes you may need to make in the future for either how you're communicating it or what types of solutions you're providing. So stay connected, challenge your HR team to pull those, pull those stats inform you as leaders on where you may need to course correct. Okay, good. And that's good advice too. Again, just be able to help with that, right? You know, it's going to be a really tricky time in the second half of the year. I can tell that, yes. you know, coming up and, and we'll have another question and answer period as well. So thanks Chris for asking that question. And we'll have another question and answer period near the end of the session. So again, everybody type in your questions as soon as you think about them and we'll uh, field those in just a moment. I do have a couple of other questions just to ask or three other questions just to ask. So uh, one of them is, and Dan, this is for you as well from the HR perspective, what can organizations do to help people in terms of being able to help cope or employees to help cope with that post COVID environment? environment. Any other tips that you want to share in terms of being able to help, say, the poor person here on this screen having a meltdown to go yeah, and share I, and be able to help cope with it? I think, I think I talked about a lot of the things that I wanted to talk about already. Um, you know, one of the things, again, like, I'm going to go back to the leaders because they're the first point of contact for our frontline teams, right? And it's really, as an organization, really making sure that they're equipped to coach and support in a virtual manner, especially if you've shifted, right? So, Typically, they may not be used to supporting their team virtually. Now they're supporting them virtually. Make sure you provide them with the right tools and the right technologies and revisit how you're hiring people, right? So the competencies that you're looking for, I think Neil was talking a little bit about this. Um, you know, the skill sets uh, maybe not might not be the same to excel in a virtual environment versus actually being on a call center, on a contact center for contact center 
explore. Um, so, you know, I, I always go back to the teachers, right? When we were hiring teachers, we didn't look for their uh, tech savviness um, and their ability to run Zoom calls. Now they're facilitating whole classrooms on Zoom. And some have struggled because we weren't looking for that skill set. I can bet you as we look to hire teachers in the future, we're going to course correct on that. And we're going to start to look for that technical savviness. Um, so that we can be better equipped to handle something like this in the future. So I would encourage us to kind of do the same, um, you know, in the contact center world as well. Great. That's great advice, Dana. You're right. There's so many things that have changed in the past year. I'll say from the training perspective and going virtual, again, it's a different environment. So all those things are there, right? All the adjustments, all the changes that are there. And it actually brings up an interesting legal one. Oh, you went on mute, Mike. Oh, there we go. Thank you for that <laughs> little glitch there. Uh, so, John, the question for you kind of relate the whole idea now about people working from home settling the last year, which is, and I've seen that some contact centers decided to go and stay remote. They're going to keep everybody at home. They hired people to be in the office, sent them all home. Now they're going to keep them home permanently. If an employee was hired to work in the office, their employer switches to just being entirely work from home like that. You know, can that employee claim they were laid off rather than, than you know, refuse to accept remote work? So for, for purposes of, of unemployment, the answer is no. If, if the position exists and the person can work from home and there's an offer for them to work from home, they're technically resigning from the position. So, that, so to get unemployment, uh, you'd have to be fired for things other than misconduct, whether, whether you're not performing the job well or COVID shut everything down. Those are reasons to get unemployment. In reality, uh, unemployment is so backed up right now that a lot of uh, unemployment uh, uh, states are essentially approving the applications without even uh, viewing them. Uh, the bigger issue that I'm seeing is people are, act are actually working from home and now the employer is starting to want to bring them to the physical office and the employees are scared and now they're refusing to come back. So it's kind of like the, you know, the opposite situation. An employer, even though they, they really should listen to their employees and their concerns, at the end of the day, they have to make tough decisions sometimes that the employees are not going to like. Employees are at will. They could be fired for any reason or no reason as, at all, as long as it's not discriminatory based on a protected class like race, age, religion, gender, disability, or other small protections like whistleblower protections or people complaining about wages and things of that nature that are, that are protected. Now, the only exception to that rule is, let's say you have somebody home and again, they're, they're suffering from a disability and they get the proper medical documentation and say, hey, listen, I could do my work from home. I've been doing it for the last year. I have this medical condition where I can no longer perform the job at the location, but I can't successfully perform it at home. In that situation, your employer to not violate the law is required to allow that person to continue working from home. Uh, so that's really where I've seen most of the issues fall. Great. And, and John, I'm glad you brought up both those scenarios because, of course, you've got different contact centers facing different kinds of scenarios, right? Everybody at home, everybody come in halfway in between, just like we saw in the pool at the very start of the session. So a lot of great questions that I think contact center leaders need to ask their legal teams, you know, for the local jurisdictions to find out how to handle this and bring the HR team as well involved, of course, in terms of being able to not just legally what can you do, but also what should you do to help your employees? You know, what extras can you do to help them as well? And Danny, you look like you want to say something. So I do. I just, I just want to talk again, you know, how that dovetails into engagement, right? So, you, you know, I, I've been at home for a year working from home. Now you're telling me there's a business need and I need to come in, but I just demonstrated for 12 months that I can do my job from home, right? So regardless, you know, again, the legalities and actually getting that person back in, there's going to be a bit of an engagement hit there, right? So, you know, I think as leaders, we need to have the answer, well, why do I need you to come back in? Um, pretty sound and pretty concrete uh, to be able to explain it to somebody um, to try and, you know, get ahead of that engagement, in my opinion. Okay, good. All right, excellent. I appreciate that, Dana. And I'm going to ask Neil, as, a, as an ops leader, as an operational leader, what are your thoughts about that as far as this whole issue about bring them all in, keep them all home, halfway in between engagement? What are your thoughts? So uh, I skew uh, a lot one way, which is uh, we are migrating from a traditionally bricks and mortar only contact center to a work from home heavy contact center. Uh, it is not a good business model to have uh, commercial real estate right now and, and bricks and mortar sites and sites and sites and sites because you can't take advantage of them. Meaning if you have a hundred workstations for your contact center employees, 
with social distancing, you can only use, depending on where you are, maybe about 50 at best. So whoever's the owner of that property or whoever's re- paying for the rent for that or the mortgage, you're only getting uh, a, a limited bang for your buck, right? Where I'm going with this is uh, I don't believe investing in buildings and sites right now. And I think for the medium term, at least, that's not going to be attractive. Uh, we are going to try to incubate, cultivate, and begin to push out our team members, work from home, go home, come in if it's an emergency, come in if your internet connectivity sucks, <laughs> sorry, if it's terrible, if it's not audible, if there's uh, connection issues, um, or if there's a one-off thing, but the default is going to be go work from home because we have the tools in place to monitor uh, the IT component of things, how how good or not good the connection quality is, compliance, productivity, and performance. And if we can measure all of those things just as effectively, and so far we've been able to prove out that those that our team members are just as productive from home, if not more, than our, our limited team that's on site right now. I, for me, I've seen the future. I didn't believe it before. Pre-COVID, I would have never, I would have looked at myself in the mirror and said, are you crazy? What are you, what are you smoking? But, you know, we were given lemons and now we're making some lemonade out of it. And I've seen the light and the model is work from home. Those that are going to insist in coming back in, we'll find a place for you to come back in. It's going to be limited. Most people, at least in the market where we, where we operate, they want to be home and we're going to give it to them. Neil, I have a question for you. Um, you know, some people that I've spoken to, some of the challenges they're facing is that clean desk policy, right? So how do you, how do you manage that when somebody's actually working from home? Great question. Yeah, it, it's a great question. So uh, around things like payment card industry compliance, PCI compliance, where you're, you're especially coming into contact with payment cards, we have to mandate a clean desk policy. Our team members have signed documents to uphold the clean desk policy. But I don't have a camera in their home. Yeah. And until I'm able to do so, I don't know. And I don't yeah. think we're ever going to be able to have a camera in anybody's home. I, I certainly wouldn't want uh, the legal team coming after me and accusing us of, of trying to do that stuff because... We can't right now. Um, what we do have in place is that it's a written policy. We make the team members uphold it. Um, we are able to uh, monitor and measure and record everything that is going on from a keystroke perspective. What is it that team members are doing with their laptops? We record every keystroke, what site they're on, what page, what tools they're using. And if they're out of compliance for some reason, alarms go off and we can get things shut down or detected very, very quickly. Um, so there's, there's a tight lock and key, but we're, we're limited by what you just described, which is yeah. it's, we're, we're relying on some good faith right here. And I have explained that to our clients that there's only so much we can do it until the laws change and if they ever change. And by the way, I wouldn't want a camera in my living room for my employer. I don't want that. And it'd be, I, it'd be difficult for me to ask my team members, team members to do something that I'm personally not comfortable with. Uh, I, I don't think we're ever going to have that. So it's, we got to have some faith here and put the IT to IT tools in place to support, um, to support what we need to accomplish. Okay, and you know, that's a really good point as well. I just got a, 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 one of the chat messages was from actually Marty from Intelligence. Uh, and he was mentioning the fact that there are some technologies that will allow you to have uh, you know, that kind of private client uh, interaction and compliance. So there are some technology that can help with that, thankfully. Uh, but you're right yeah. though, it's an issue. Somebody can also just pen write you know, a credit card number down a piece of paper in the living room. So it's, that, you know, that analog side of things as well, writing up post-it notes and things, but definitely, you know, again, just different issues to think about when it comes to, you know, making work from home a, a permanent thing. I don't know, Jonathan, do you have any legal thoughts as far as this whole issue of compliance and privacy with employees? Well, the, the, the only other issue that, that I've had uh, is uh, again, some employers contacting me about uh, pretend, you know, they, they want people to come back to the workplace and they also want to make it safe uh, for everyone. So they do pass, uh, a law within their business or policies, better to say, a policy within their business requiring people to have vaccinations. Uh, and that's a hot topic because a lot of uh, employees, they don't trust the vaccinations yet. It's, you know, their body. They don't want, they don't want to, they don't want to have it. And uh, like I said before, th- th- this is an at-will state and uh, employers can pass that policy and are allowed to terminate employees who refuse to get the vaccination with limited exception. And again, in that in that limited exception, uh, one is that reasonable accommodation for a disability if they provide some medical documentation that for some reason they 
there's something in that vaccination that the individual is allergic to, then the employer can't require it. Or there could be a religious accommodation. Uh, let's say somehow, uh, based upon their religion, they can't inject this, this vaccine. But it has to be, the employer can't ask for proof that it is a bona fide religious exemption. In other words, that, um, that employee uh, better not have had other vaccines and not just you know, making it up just for this purpose. So uh, that, that's an issue. There's also an issue of people who cl you know, claim to be exposed uh, to someone who had COVID. So you have someone, let's say, so, let's say an employee's out uh, sick for COVID, you're paying them, depending upon the size and how much money the company makes, you could be paying them 56 hours or, or you could be paying them 40 hours of leave for COVID they come back a week later, they say, oh, by the way, now my spouse has it and I have to quarantine again. There are issues with respect to what kind of proof you could require. Is, is that still paid versus unpaid? Do you get uh, tax credits? So again, all these things vary state by state. So I'm just kind of throwing it out there and giving employers and employees things to think about and, and look up in the local jurisdiction. Uh, you know, before December 31st, 2020, we had the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which here in the United States was, you know, was blanketing the entire country. That expired at the end of the year. So now these states have all these different laws and everyone's kind of like going rogue in a sense. And it makes it even more difficult uh, when you have a company that operates in different states. Okay, good. And, and I think there too, Mike, different countries too, right? Because there's some things around vaccine, proof of vaccine that are very different in Canada as well. So I'm going to reiterate what John said, you know, check with your local HR, your local legal team before you, you know, start making decisions like that. Yeah, and that's so important too, because so many contact centers are multi-site, even multi-country. Yeah. And so again, there's a whole, there could be a lot of different cities, a lot of different provinces, states, countries involved in this. So again, a lot of different rules might apply to different areas, you know, when you're multi-site like this, multi-city, multi-country. So again, just some key things to go and consider. And I really appreciate you bringing this up because all three of you bringing this up because they're just things that we have to look at, you know, as an industry and certainly as leaders to go and take a look at. And we focus so far in this, in this show all about looking in terms of of the impact of the company itself, the organization and its employees. Now let's take a look in terms of, you know, the customers that are out there. And actually, Neil, I want to ask you this question from an ops perspective. How do you see customer behavior changing post COVID? I mean, how do you think they'll be different now in the second half of the year and going forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the world changed and certainly there's more changes to come, but where are we at now? Um, the world is an e-commerce world. It's a digital world. By the way, I, I would love to see those words go away. Anyone who's thinking in terms of e-commerce versus, like, we're an e-commerce world. It's part of our lives. I don't think we need to differentiate necessarily e-commerce from the rest of the way uh, consumers consume. Uh, I, I think I, I'd like to see those terms start to evolve or eventually just disappear. Uh, but that being said, we got a pass, you know, during the first couple weeks of COVID. Uh, it was okay for there to be a queue. It was okay to um, hear the baby at home and 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 the, or the pets or the stuff like you know all the stuff that's going on in people's worlds when they're working from home. I think that there's a bit less tolerance for those things now, and people don't want to wait. They're not happy that uh, it's taking a long time to get goods from China into stores or into websites and having their orders fulfilled. There's frustration with that to the point that John Goodman's study on customer rage that he's been doing for the last tons of years, customer rage is on the rise. Customer rage is a thing. Customers are not patient. They want to be have their issues handled, resolved with low effort and in the least amount of time possible. For me, those are the major things that we need to focus on to really consider ourselves customer centric, customer experience focused, focus on speed of answer, speed of resolution and effort. You can't show me a customer out there that doesn't want one or most of those things. For me, those are the common things. Other than that, I don't have a crystal ball to tell you, you know, that 93% of, uh, of customers are gonna prefer to pay with Visa over MasterCard. I, I don't know, I, I'm not an expert in that stuff. Or something that, you know, consumers are only gonna wanna do self-service versus, uh, versus, you know, being handled by a live agent. You, there's so many different studies. You can go on Google and find every single version of that stuff that's out there. And there's no true version of that. Consumers are smarter, they're wiser, they have more choices, but they want their issues resolved. Those parts of that make up customer experience 
are that much more critical and we need to resolve and treat them well. Okay, good. And those are really good points as well, especially with customers now in terms of just, you know, what they need, what their demands are, what their patience level is when it comes to, again, call waiting times, things like that, right? So it just gets back to the heart of service, offering really great service, you know, going forward. And I want to throw things open again to the, to everyone who's watching this now to go and submit your questions. So you have time for a second Q&A session right now. So again, type in your questions. We've got a few of them here. So I just want to go and, and uh, I uh, mentioned some of these as well. Um, I'm just going to mention just a few of the comments that are here. Uh, one of them is from, uh, again, Marty from Intelligence. Thank you for this, to clarifying this. Uh, Marty mentions the fact that there are technologies that allow team members to transfer a call to a compliant payment method. So that's one solution that's out there. That's really important. Uh, Rob also uh, mentioned there are some solid PCI management companies and technologies that are available as well that can be bolted on to some of the cloud contact center uh, services that are out there. So again, just different ways to go and handle that scenario. Uh, want to mention as well a question from uh, Ra uh, Raul who asked about, and this is for anybody here, any thoughts from reviewing the local area or company services provided before bringing people back? An example being, you know, around, if you're going to bring people back to the office, are there still restaurants and cafes around your office? You know, coffee shops, things like that, or, or has a whole support system for your office kind of, you know, other, other things that are out there, dry cleaners, et cetera, have they gone away? So I guess, Dan, I'll direct this to you from an HR perspective. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it, it's interesting because we went through uh, a stage in, um, let's call it last July, where we brought a group of people back where, uh, for those of you who don't know, Ontario's in a stay-at-home order again. Uh, so really skeleton essential staff uh, back in the office. But we did look at that, right? So, you know, it's, it's hard enough asking people to come in when, let's call it 80% of their peers are not coming in for whatever reason that team was deemed essential. You need to make sure you have the infrastructure there to support them um, to have an okay day at work, right? So um, I know one of the things we talked about was do we or don't we close the lunchroom down, right? Um, but then we were like, if we close the lunchroom down, where are people going to get food? If they can't keep their lunch cold and warm their lunch up, do we really want them to leave the building even if there is something open down the street? So, you know, again, I, I talk about, you know, when, you, when you're looking at these things and you're planning, you need to be planning holistically um, and keep your guiding principles, like I mentioned at the beginning, in mind. Our number one guiding principle uh, in our organization is the health and well-being of our employees. Being able to eat a warm meal is part of that well-being. So, good. Good response mm -hmm. to looking at that. And Neil, what are your thoughts from again looking at operations perspective? How important is that local area around your sites? I know you're looking more for work from home. Yeah, it, but it, 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 it is. It's important. We have people that are that are in our buildings now. It's exactly critical for them to go to the bathroom. Are the bathrooms clean? Are they equally or safer than they were pre-COVID? Are they comfortable? Is there a place to go have lunch? How's public transportation? In, in, in the markets we operate in, public, public transportation is still an important thing. Fortunately, that, that hasn't been a limit for us, um, but those are critical factors. And, and I thank Dana for bringing these to my attention. I'm actually learning and listening. I don't, I'm not the one in, you know, uh, that close to those decisions and that management, but those are the things we need to be concerned about. And I haven't thought about it in that level of detail. I'm glad, she, like I said, she, she, she called them out. They're critical. They're absolutely critical because you need to have people feel comfortable. It's not they're going to go somewhere else down the block or, you know, the next town over that does essentially the same thing or is offering them more money because you're not filling their buckets. Okay, good. And you mentioned that the part about money or salary, and I know it's a very hot job market right now. Surprise with COVID, but it's a very hot job market in the contact center industry. Neil, from your perspective, uh, you know, how do you, you know, what are some of the challenges, what are some of the things that you can do to help retain your employees and help keep your agents, your team leaders, your quality assurance coaches on board? Uh, yeah, I, I think that this component has not changed necessarily during COVID. It's the same challenges we've had since before COVID, which is you have to hire the right people for the right positions. You have to train them. And training is not a one-time thing. Training is an ongoing thing, educa ongoing education, keep them uh, feeling good and confident about their ability to perform. If they're not confident or if they don't know, they're not going to perform. Forget about it. You know, you're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, someone that's not trained versus a job that really requires training, forget about it. You're, you're, you're cooked. Uh, you need to focus on that. Obviously, compensation is important. Career pathing is important. Um, letting them feel listened to. We do employee satisfaction surveys, uh, but we learned early on it's not sufficient just to do the survey. We all talk to you about listening. Listening is critical. But if you don't do something with what you listen to, it doesn't matter. You're just an empty suit. We can't be empty suits. We have to be able to actually execute on the things that people are telling us show them that we value their opinions, create 
jobs, create opportunities for them, let them have some flexibility. Uh, in the case, I think Dana called out about gender. You know, if there's working moms that need to go home an hour early or, or breastfeeding or, or, or things of that nature, you have to provide comfort for them. If not, like I said, you're going to go down the road and find a place that is willing to offer those things. Uh, for me, that's, that's the big piece. And, and then another thing is just around compensation. Provide incentives. Provide a way to, for people to make money, to, to, to earn a good living, to feel good about their jobs. And they'll come back tomorrow morning. I think that's, that's the honest truth. Treat them you know, like they deserve to be treated and they'll come back. You know, one of the things you said really hits home around, you know, when you ask people and then you do nothing about it, right? And you said, you just, I actually think you're worse off if you ask and do nothing about it than not having asked at all. Um, so I think that that's really important. And I, and I go back to that honesty thing. I said, if something comes forward and you just can't do it, you can't support it, just be honest with people versus pretending it never came forward. It's so true. We, so we used to do the thing uh, around our ESAT surveys. You know, for me, it was all about the survey, the survey, but, but, but we got to be doing surveys. We got to get data. No, I was wrong. It wasn't about the survey. It was about showing the people that contributed to the survey that the feedback they gave us mattered and that we did something with it. So instead of doing it, I think I, we originally wanted to do it every month and then it moved to quarterly. And then we did it, we've moved to a place of comfort right now, which is I think every six months. And that gives us sufficient time to be able to execute and put into place plans that prove that uh, the exercises are actually authentic. If, if I could also jump in here, uh, you know, in, in New York, we're required to do some type of reopening plan. And uh, I, I thought it was great and was very smart uh, of the state to require it because as an employer, you're gonna have to understand that people are gonna get sick. Um, you're gonna have an employee at some point in time come to you and say that they have COVID uh, and you don't wanna be caught having them think that the workplace is where they got it. So if you have a plan and if you have the posters of you know, masks are required and the postings of six feet distances are required, uh, in New York, what we do here is we email each employee before the beginning of their shift attesting to the fact that they don't have fever or other symptoms, attesting to the fact that they haven't been in contact with someone who's had COVID and there's some other questions. They have to fill out that form every day before, not at work, not actually physically going to the workplace. They fill it out on a, on a form uh, that gets emailed to them. And this way, eventually when it comes out, because it even happened to me, I had a few employees come, but at least you know that you've done everything that you can. And if they did catch it, they probably caught it somewhere else. And you have to show your employees and, and, you know, your employees are going to be watching you. You want to show them that you care about them and you care about their safety. Uh, so it's critical that, uh, God forbid, one of your employees gets sick and, and really have a tough time with it, that uh, they don't think that it's because of your lack of action. Uh, and the other employees, therefore, are, are, are watching you and will feel safe as well and, and ultimately be more productive. And, you know, one of the things we did at my organization is we did those things and now we do a weekly, a weekly um, um, inspection. So we said to our employees before we brought them back, we're going to do these 20 things to keep you safe, whatever these 20 were. And we check weekly to make sure that those 20 things, 20 things are happening. And that inspection becomes a document that we can always point to to say, we checked to make sure our signs were up. We checked to make sure people were wearing masks if they weren't at their desk. We checked X, Y, Z. Um, and it just keeps that diligence because signs fall, signs fall, people start to get complacent. Um, so it just kind of keeps that diligence up. Those are, those are really great points as well, because again, you have to ensure their safety, you know, make sure that people feel comfortable so they can really feel engaged and, and relaxed enough to talk to customers or, or, you know, exchange messages, live chats okay. with them, et cetera. And Neil, I'm going to ask you a question too, in terms of, because I know one of the things that happens, of course, is that companies, if they outsource, are looking for outsources, BPOs, that actually take good care of their people, that actually, you know, do, that actually, you know, are socially responsible in that sense. Neil, what are some questions that, you know, if companies are looking, you know, towards, you know, another contact center, an outsource of some kind, what are some questions or requests that they should have in terms of looking at a provider for the second half of the year? So in other words, what's going on out there in that marketplace? I appreciate that. I love the question, Mike. Um, I think the marketplace in a, in a favorable way has, has, has uh, evolved. So in the old days, uh, the BPO was kind of treated like the, um, the lowest person on the totem pole. Uh, what our opinions were didn't really matter. And we were just kind of told to, um, you know, to jump and we'd have to ask how high. 
there's still a little bit of that, but the conversation and the relationship building has evolved. We're now um, increasingly seen as a partner, an important uh, link in the chain. We are the ambassador, the brand ambassadors. We're, we're the voice of the brand in front of the customer. Um, where I'm going with this is I would love to be, the most successful relationships we have with our clients are where we are considered an equal partner at the table. We're consulted on technology stack. We're consulted on, hey, would you like to have your team work from home? Or, or do you prefer to have them on site? We've had clients that come to us and say, you must have your people work on site. And my, it, what my thought bubble over my head is, are you telling your employees that? Why do you have a right to tell my employees that and how I manage and dictate you know, the safety of my, my team members? I don't actually articulate it as such, but um, I, I want us to be considered as equals in the conversation because we are, I think, good at what we do. And there's a reason we've been able to do this for this long. There are things we've learned over the years technology, operations, metrics, hiring practices. Um, the one thing you, you mentioned, so we participate in a lot of RFPs, requests for proposals, right? Companies that want to engage companies like ours and they talk to five or 10 of them and they all put us into these processes and ask us a trillion questions. And the trillion questions are typically around the standards, stuff that you can imagine. What are your service levels? What are your, you know, your, what's your attrition? What's your, what, that type of stuff. But interestingly, the way these RFPs have started to evolve is we start to get asked this, Tell us about how you value your employees. How would you describe your employee experience? What are you doing to retain your employees? And so we're asked a lot about what, what we do to make our team members stay and hopefully feel good about working with us. More and more of those kinds of things. Now more and more qualitative, the types of questions we get versus quantitative. It used to be, what is, like I said, you know, the, what was your results of the last week, week over week results for the last 35 years? Okay, we can do that. We copy paste that. That stuff is less and less relevant now. It's more along the lines of how can we hopefully reflect the culture of the companies that are going to hire us? Again, not an easy task, but, we, and we have to do, do lots of things to lots of different companies. But that's, I think, where this market has evolved. How do we become those brand ambassadors? How do we adopt the brand voice of our clients and represent them well in the marketplace? And I'm glad you shared that. I know we've got a lot of uh, different BPO people in the audience. So I'm really glad that you shared that advice with them. And also companies possibly looking to outsource parts as well. And I love the fact that it's becoming more socially conscious and the idea about employee retention, because again, re highly engaged employees typically offer better service. So there is a benefit as well, you know, overall for doing this. So just, it all comes together that way. And I really want to thank all three of you and Dana, Jonathan, Neil, thank you for sharing your expertise with our audience. We really appreciate this. And it's great to hear the different perspectives as well, legal, HR, and ops to kind of balance all of that to take care of the employees and bring them back or, or have them, you know, have the whole situation evolve safely and productively for everybody. And that's really key. So thank you to all three of you for being a part of this. Great. Thank, thank you, Mike. Welcome. And I just want to share uh, just a few quick announcements as well, just to quickly wrap things up. One of them is, I just want to mention in terms of, and this is for GTAC, it's the Greater Toronto Area Contact Centre Association, one of the co-organizers of this event. And there's a couple of events that are coming up with them. The first one up is on April the 22nd. It's a one-hour webinar, and it's about mastering remote training and onboarding. So again, given the whole COVID environment and, you know, work from home, it's just really important to be able to have those really great remote training programs and onboarding programs as well. So that's coming up on the 22nd. Again, more information at GTAC, gtacc.ca. The second GTAC announcement is for the uh, Excellence Awards, and this is in terms of looking at some of the best in terms of the Canadian, in this case, contact center industry, and a really great chance to go and nominate team members, teams, departments, companies, et cetera, for offering really great excellence in terms of the customer, uh, the whole customer contact center, sorry, the whole contact center uh, industry as well. And that's coming up on June the 3rd, but nominations though can be made right now and nominations are open for the next few weeks. I believe until uh, April 22nd or, or roughly approximately that in terms of making nominations for that. And again, you can look at that in the GTAC website, gtacc.ca. Lastly, one last announcement I wanna thank as well, all the sponsors for the program. And again, thank you all the sponsors for doing this. I also want to thank Ken from Intelligence and Marty from Intelligence for helping to organize this event and offering technical support for this and also sharing ideas. And again, feel free to reach out to Intelligence. It's intelligence.com, Cloud Contact Center. Just if you have questions about digital transformation or anything else, they can help you with that. Lastly, I want to thank all of you for being a part of this webinar, for being, for being able to ask questions and share ex expertise as well. Um, it's really been great to go and have this kind of a discussion. I think it's a really useful and critical one as far as what's coming up with the 
second half of the year. So it's a great chance for us to go and hear these examples and, and you know, hear Dana, uh, Neil and Jonathan and yourself, and also as well to go and have questions asked from the, those of you in the audience as well. So thank you for doing that. And, and Krista, Rob, you know, uh, Marty, Sangeeta, thanks for asking those questions and making those comments as well. Also a link to the YouTube recording of this um, conversation will also be available early next week and they'll get sent out to all the people who've registered for this webinar. So you have that available. So if you want to share it with your teams or even look over it again, they'll have a chance to go and do that. And that'll be coming out early next week. So thank you everyone. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks everybody. <laughs>